Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, good morning. Uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming that early. And Friday, we know that uh, and it has been a very long day uh, last night, uh, last day, uh, yesterday, sorry. And we will even attend it at night, they left back home at 11 uh, p.m. because of uh, a very interesting workshop um, done by Dr. McIntyre and uh, colleagues Dr. Sam and Dr. So, uh, thank you very much for, for coming that early. Um, also, I, I need to thank Dr. Tarek Darwish, uh, the conference chair, uh, because uh, all what you see in the organization is, uh, uh, should be through uh, the conference chair. Uh, we did lots of uh, activities, we did lots of, uh, of uh, rehearsals, and uh, because of the uh, very large work of the conference and the organizing committee, uh, I, I want to also thank all the moderators, uh, Dr. Mufid, uh, Dr. Amani, uh, Dr. Yarhi, and all other colleagues in, in, uh, who helped us in this uh, great uh, organization. Uh, our uh, junior colleagues, uh, Dr. Shashana, Dr. Rayan, and uh, all other colleagues like Dr. Ala Akadari, uh, all of them really uh, helped us uh, a lot, a lot to uh, have this uh, uh, organization. But the organization without audience, without interactive audience, who are really giving the meaning for the conference, uh, would be meaningless. Without you, you are meaningful. So, uh, your presence, your interaction, all the people who came uh, from different countries, uh, we have presenters from 17 countries, uh, presenters from different uh, only unfortunately till now we didn't have uh, presenters from Australia, but we have uh, colleagues from New Zealand. Uh, thanks for, for them to come. So, uh, proudly we are saying to our international conference, and this is only because of you. Uh, so, thank you very much, and we hope that we will have a very interactive uh, session today. And tomorrow in the workshops, we will be happy to see you again. So, uh, if there is any uh, mistakes or human beings, so uh, just we are just for any uh, mistakes that might happen or might happen, happen yesterday. So, we are sorry for that, but we are very thankful for you to, to be with us. Uh, me, as uh, one of the organizing committee, I'm, I'm very thankful for you, but I need to thank the uh, committee, uh, especially because he's already in the main session.
he humbly accepted that I would just mention two statements, very humbly by uh, Professor McIntyre. He's a professor of psychiatry and pharmacology at the University of Toronto and head of mood disorders psych pharmacology unit at the University Health Network, Toronto, Canada. And he was named by Clarivet Analytics Thompson Reuters in 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18 as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. Please welcome Professor. of 
obesity, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, on brain function in adults with depression. And what we know is that diabetes and obesity metastasize to the brain. So depression affects the brain, obesity and diabetes metastasize and adversely affect the brain. And if you have depression, you're more likely to have diabetes and obesity. Uh, many would know here in the region, we see some of the highest rates globally in diabetes and obesity. So I'm gonna focus on depression today, but I think if we don't look at the neck down, we're missing an important point. By the way, for those who are interested, when we look at efficacy outcomes with antidepressant medicine, the antidepressant medicines in psychiatry in major depression may not be as effective in obese people as they are in normal weight individuals. Now we know that's the case for fluoxetine. We don't know if that's the case for all agents or all classes. But that really speaks to an academic point, a mechanism, but also speaks to an interesting clinical point, and that is how important it is for us to prevent and treat obesity. Two years ago, we put a paper in the American Heart Association's journal circulation where we were able to argue that just by having depression, you have a risk factor for cardiovascular disease no different than the Framingham risk factors like hypertension or smoking or dyslipidemia. The goals of treatment are to get patients better, that is, to achieve a remitted and uh, state and functional restoration, and to try and keep that state over the long term. So really, in fact, I'm going to talk about treatments, recognizing that the treatments that get you better in depression are typically the treatments that keep you better. And broadly speaking, symptom attenuation is the goal with functional recovery. Now, most of us in the room see you know, different types of patients. Once patients have failed multiple therapies, the goals shift away from symptoms and really are largely focusing on full functional recovery uh, in these patients. Let's if we can now uh, look at some of the treatments. But again, before I get into this, just another comment about the state of the union. We already know that in uh, depression, once a patient with depression in North America sees a healthcare provider, about 15 to 20 percent of them will not come for the follow-up assessment. So once they're assessed, diagnosed with depression, 15 to 20 percent don't go for the follow-up appointment. And for those that do, about 20 to 30 percent stop seeing the doctor or the nurse after about four weeks. Now for those patients who come for at least four weeks, another 50% drop out in the next three months. My point is, is that we're gonna talk about psychosocial treatment, medication, and neural stimulation, but all of this I think is useless. It's a useless presentation. If there's not some emphasis given to how we're gonna motivate patients, integrate patients, deal with the cultural, the stigma, some of the family aspects as well to get them involved. Now the best treatments that we have psychologically for treating depression in the acute phase is with cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, and behavioral activation. I think most know that, particularly in the case of cognitive behavioral therapy. What about recurrence prevention? Well, CBT and mindfulness-based approaches have the best evidence in recurrence prevention. And what's interesting is that many people are now looking at giving patients medications in the acute phase and then trying to keep patients well in the long term by switching them over to mindfulness-based therapies. That has an academic uh, interest to many people, and I think for some patients that's a reality. That is treating them to full remission with an antidepressant and switching to mindfulness. But to be quite frank with you, that's not the case for most patients that I see. Most patients that I see require medications indefinitely. I tend to see very uh, ill, very chronic, uh, highly treatment resistant patients. But this is an interesting concept. We have another uh, center in Toronto that gives patients ketamine for depression. And what we're doing now is giving people ketamine as a treatment for depression, which I'll come back to in a moment, for two weeks. And then after they're out of their depressive state, we then switch them over to mindfulness or CBT. So CBT or mindfulness, the acute and maintenance uh, efficacy, I don't think we really know for sure which one is more effective. Both seem to be very effective 
uh, from my perspective. In North American psychiatry, there's been a lot of interest in genetic and genomic testing as a way to inform which antidepressant a patient should be given or not given. The rationale for genetic and genomic testing is very clear. We see differences between individuals in efficacy, tolerability, and safety. It is more than a hint. It's a strong indication that genetics are playing a role. In many parts of the United States and Canada, genetic and genomic testing has really become very popular. And there have been uh, messages that have been communicated by the manufacturers of these products that all patients all the time should be gene tested. I strongly disagree. The evidence does not support that. The evidence would support that in some situations, some patients do benefit from genetic and genomic testing. Patients who uh, consistently report poor tolerability, patients who have consistent inefficacy, and certainly there are some patient subgroups that we should be thinking about genomic testing. I always use the example of someone who is of Han Chinese background and I'm considering carbamazepine as a treatment. Let's say they have bipolar disorder. I'm going to check their HLA-B1502 antigen to make sure they're not at high risk of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. But I just want to let you know that at least in North American psychiatry, the behavior is far exceeding the science as it relates to genomic testing. Now, the way we've hierarchically organized our Canadian guidelines, you've seen this hierarchy before. We have the levels of evidence supporting a recommendation, and then we have the recommendation. We recommend it first, second, or third. Now, it would be uh, the case that a tricyclic antidepressant, which are effective antidepressants, they have level one evidence, unequivocally, but they're not recommended as a first-line therapy because of safety and tolerability disadvantages. So when you're crafting a guideline, it's about integrating the science along with then providing an algorithm uh, of, of care. Now as it relates to the antidepressants that we currently have, uh, we have a number of different antidepressants that we are considering. There's a number of newer entries into the antidepressant area. You can see the specific call out of 40 oxygen I'm calling that one out because oxygen has been recently identified by the US FDA as the only antidepressant that has direct independent effects on cognition. And that's been an area of academic and clinical interest to me for a long time because depression is not a mood disorder. Depression is a mood and cognitive disorder. And most of our antidepressants have not successfully addressed the cognitive deficits in depression which for most people is the principal reason why they don't return to pre-morbid levels of functioning. Let's say we can have a look at some of the antidepressants, given the relatively brief, I'll call this a wiki presentation, this is a wiki presentation, brief. Uh, I'm not going to cover all of the antidepressants and all of the detail, but if you look over here to the far right, or sorry, the far left, uh, my pointer is doing me justice here, you can see we have antidepressant categories and agents. And so the million dollar question is, which is the right antidepressant to start with? And we don't have a simple answer. That's why genomic testing has been so popular. But again, I think it's been uh, uh, making uh, sort of statements that probably don't deliver just yet. But the point I want to leave you with here is that we've got a variety of first line antidepressants, SSRIs, SNRIs, we have receptor modulators, we have multimodal agents, and all of these agents would be very uh, reasonable in any given individual patient. Now, one of the questions that we often ask ourselves is, does the specifiers matter? So the DSM-5 has nine specifiers that would apply to a depressive episode in depression, such as mood congruent or mood incongruent psychosis melancholia, anxious distress, and so on. And what I would say that, you know, for me as a psychiatrist, outside of psychotic depression, where a patient requires both an antidepressant and an antipsychotic, or a patient who has mixed features, I don't think specifiers have really changed how I think about first-line antidepressant therapy. Said differently, we don't have good evidence that a patient with anxious distress or melancholic depression 
does differently on antidepressant X versus antidepressant Y. But if you have psychotic depression, you certainly need to start the patient on an antidepressant and an antipsychotic. Mixed features refers to the co-occurrence of subsyndromal hypomanic symptoms while you are depressed. And we used to think that this indicated you have bipolar disorder. It certainly increases the likelihood you have bipolar disorder. But about 25% of patients with major depression have hypomanic symptoms and they don't have bipolar disorder. And these patients, in our experience, increasingly require atypical antipsychotic agents in combination with their antidepressants. Sexual dysfunction affects about 50% of patients taking SSRIs and SNRIs particularly. There's a lower risk of sexual dysfunction with bupropion, mirtazapine, falazidum, agomelatine, as well as orthioxetine. So already when you discuss with your patients some of the antidepressant options, I don't think I've ever met a patient when I ask them, do you want sexual dysfunction? They say, yes, I, I do. Uh, most don't say that. So clearly this is a reason that many patients are going to, in fact, say that they don't want certain antidepressants. And already that's more a point of differentiation across treatments. Now, drug-drug interactions are very, very relevant. I think that's the slide I'm looking at right now. Uh, yes, it is. And uh, just to highlight uh, a point, so an academic point, in North America, 10%